Well, it's my great pleasure to welcome back to Brigham University uh, Adam Fife. Adam is uh, the director of Unconventional Solutions, a U.S. government contractor in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, his lecture title today is Afghanistan, Iraq, and Counterinsurgency, Similarities, Differences, and the Way Forward. Um, Adam serves as the Director of Unconventional Solutions for a U.S. government uh, service provider where he focuses his efforts on working with U.S. agencies in new approaches to countering terrorism and insurgencies worldwide. He works throughout the Horn of Africa, Middle East, and South e Southwest Asia to better understand the complex problems that face counterinsurgency practitioners. Previously, he's worked in Iraq with Multinational Force Iraq as a senior strategist and communications advisor, and he's advised senior policymakers, U.S. government officials, military commanders, and politicians in communications and policy implementation strategy. We're very pleased to welcome him back because he is a graduate of the Kennedy Center with a B.A. in uh, International Studies. He's also done graduate work in, in uh, Middle East Studies at the University of Utah and has taught classes for the Political Science Department and uh, the Kennedy Center. Currently living in Virginia, Adam Fife and his wife Megan are the parents of two sons, Brigham and Jackson. Uh, as I mentioned, Adam has a, has a, a, a past here at the Kennedy Center. We're very pleased and honored to claim him as one of our alums, and it's always uh, very interesting to have someone who's involved in the, uh, on, on a, on a, from a perspective of what's happening on current issues that uh, we don't always see. We, we, hear the we see the headlines and we hear what's going on throughout the world, but as, as one of my colleagues was commenting the other day, it, it does seem like when things go well, we, we don't hear as much about uh, what's going on. And so it's our interest in, in uh, following up on what's going on in this part of the world. Please join me in welcoming Adam Fife. All right. Um, First of all, thanks for showing up. Uh, I, I remember as a student uh, coming to these lectures, and half of the lectures oftentimes were just over my head because it was individuals who were so engrossed in a topic that they were fascinated with, with this little aspect of something that I oftentimes was unable to comprehend what on earth they were talking about. Um, and I am unfortunately probably guilty of that, uh, and so I have tried to provide, I guess, a 30,000-foot snapshot of what has happened in Iraq and Afghanistan and perhaps some unique solutions that are being put forth uh, by the U.S. government, by individuals such as myself, to try to counter an insurgency that exists. Um, hence the, the title for my lecture. I'm going to see if I'm smart enough to figure out how this... Oh, there we go. Okay. Now, what I want to do is start out by defining an insurgency. Um, and I want to qualify a few things before I start. First off, in order to squeeze all of this into 40 minutes, uh, I have to make some fairly general, broad statements, which I'm sure some of you will disagree with. That's fine. Uh, I invite the disagreement. Um, but in order to make this work, I'm going to have to qualify a few things. Uh, and two, if as I go along, something does not make sense, please raise your hand and ask me to expound upon it further, okay? Um, and I'll try to leave a few minutes for questions and answers. Uh, and again, my, some of these definitions are less academic and more operational, so more so what I'm familiar with from being out in the field and dealing with this more on a first-hand basis, vice what, what a textbook will say. Um, so an insurgency, as I've come to understand it, uh, is defined as a rebellion against a recognized authority. Okay, that can be, it can be a recognized authority, i.e. a state. It can be, um, it can be religious. So there, insurgency kind of encapsulates a lot of different things. Uh, an insurgency is organized, okay, so they're, they're, they have an objective. But once that objective is achieved, it fractures, okay, because you're going to have fissures within that insurgent group, okay, that's going to have different desires once their objective is achieved. And, and that's important to remember. Um, it also tends to work with a protracted timeline. In other words, typically they do not have you know a six-month cutoff date to where they say, okay, I have to accomplish my objective. If I don't, we're just going to give up. Uh, insurgencies will go on for years and years and years until the objective is accomplished or until the insurgency itself is, is shut down. Um, and an insurgency is typically entirely dependent upon the local community 
for support and for success. And oftentimes an insurgency is built up of various aspects of a local community, okay? And we need to look at, at an insurgency when it comes to Iraq, when it comes to Afghanistan, when it comes to just about any insurgency that you find, literally on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis, okay? Because it has an overarching objective, but the, the way that an insurgent group accomplishes its, its objectives will vary dependent upon its location and the demographics in which it finds itself. Okay, so the question is, what is counterinsurgency? So how do you shut down a, uh, an insurgency? Um, and I have used some of the basic definitions that is in the COIN manual that the U.S. military uses, uh, and then some other aspects as well. The basic tenet of counterinsurgency or COIN strategy is to clear, hold, and build. And what I mean by that is, is as I said, insurgencies operate in a neighborhood-by-neighborhood -neighborhood basis. So the basic step is to clear the neighborhood of the insurgents, hold it, okay? You don't leave, you don't clear it, and then back off and walk away. The mil U.S. military calls it, you know, wash, rinse, and repeat. In other words, you continually wash your hair instead of, I don't know, I have to wash my hair every day because that's just the way my hair is. Some people maybe don't have to. But you need to be able to hold it, and then once you hold that area, you go in and you build it. You rebuild the infrastructure, you provide basic services which then allows the local population to essentially endear themselves to those that are holding the area, trust those that are executing the coin strategy, and then begin to, within the community itself, build up its own infrastructure so that when they leave, the desire to have those, ins those insurgent elements come back in has, has decreased dramatically. Um, the next point, and this is a, a phrase that Petraeus would often use along with General Odierno, is take the head off the snake. Um, how many of you guys have seen the movie The Battle of Algiers? Nobody? Well, if you ever really want a great movie on how you wage a counterinsurgency, The Battle of Algiers is, is a great movie on how not to do it. Um, it uh, the objective is to, insurgencies are oftentimes personality driven, okay? Um, and so once you're able to, what you call, take the head off the snake, a lot of times as you start lopping that head off, and you have to lop it off repeatedly, okay, but as they start dipping down into their fourth and fifth and sixth levels of leadership to run that organization, the quality of the insurgency, i.e. their ability to launch attacks and counterattacks, to uh, handle the complex logistics that is required to run an effective insurgency, diminishes significantly, all right? Um, so by doing that, you kind of knock out the people that are around the leader and you tighten the noose around that person so that he begins to feel suffocated. You limit his movements, and then you eventually go in and get him. Um, there are various means of doing that, and I'm, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, and then the third aspect, which to me personally is the most fascinating, is what we'll call information warfare. Um, because insurgent groups are extremely effective at propaganda. All right, and launching their own operations. And we'll get to this a little later, but for instance, the Taliban will attack a U.S. military convoy and they will claim 12 casualties when really nobody died and three U.S. soldiers were injured. All right, but they'll then take that, they'll publish a handbill or put it on the radio and announce their success so that psychologically, they begin to, for lack of a better term, mess with the minds of the individuals who are reading and listening to the material that they provide. So they want to provide the image or the appearance that they are winning, even though they are losing, okay? The Tet Offensive in Vietnam is a classic example of that. That was a, the Tet Offensive in Vietnam was a U.S. military victory, okay, for the most part. But the Vietnamese, the Northern Vietnamese, did a very effective job of essentially manipulating <clears throat> both international and local media to create the appearance that they had won. Um, and so it requires those who are waging a counterinsurgency to engage in what are called influence operations, counterpropaganda, so countering the misinformation these individuals put out, and then information campaigns, which is essentially how do we obtain an objective without having to kill individuals along the way? Is there another way that we can do this? So as a background, I'll use Iraq kind of as a background because I think more people understand Iraq than they do Afghanistan. Um, 
the insurgency in Iraq was, for the most part, homegrown, okay? Uh, but the thing we have to understand about Iraq, how many of you guys are Middle East Studies majors? Okay. So a quick 30-second blurb on Iraq. Iraq was, for 30 years, uh, ruled by Saddam Hussein, uh, had a very highly educated populace, okay, um, and for the most part was fairly secular. They are, yes, they are a, a uh, Muslim nation with 99.9% uh, you know, .9 of those individuals adhering to the Islamic faith, but Saddam Hussein himself was fairly secular, and as a result, there really wasn't much what we call Islamic fundamentalism fundamentalism that actually existed within Iraq. And when the U.S. went into Iraq in 2003, that's what they found. Um, but what the U.S. obviously messed up on, grant, you know, granted the first three years were pretty rough for the United States, um, is they fired the military and then did not do a good job in engaging the population itself. All right, The U.S. military and their coalition partners sat in these big bases and would go out and plow through a town, sometimes run over little kids, kill people, do a snatch and grab, and then go back to their big base. So there, there, was, no, there was no effort to create a relationship. The State Department would refuse to leave its confines. The USAID was the same way. Um, so you began to create, you know, they began to be upset. However, the local Iraqis, for the most part, were not well-versed in how to actually conduct an insurgency. This is where the foreign fighters come in. Uh, as, we, as we all know, al-Qaeda sent in an influx of foreign fighters who then took these individuals who had motivation, organized them, and then put them to work. Okay? Um, a few things that are important to remember about the Iraq insurgency is that it was not tribe-specific. This is important when we get to Afghanistan. Tribes helped play a role, okay, but the downfall was that al-Qaeda did not understand the role that tribes actually play in Iraq and did not respect the positions of those local tribal leaders. Um, typically, insurgent groups broke down on Sunni and Shia lines. Uh, they were both internally and externally funded. There were definite, uh, were and to, to some cases today still are, definite funding chains and mechanisms that existed from outside of Iraq. Um, and they were organized by neighborhood, city, province, and country. So what, what you're looking at is a very organized group, okay? Uh, and again, we're comprised of some of these. You have IED. You know, all they do is they focus on IEDs. And that includes, you know, suicide bombings, vehicle bombings, house bombs, roadside bombs. That's all these individuals did, okay? Uh, funding, people who essentially procured funding. And funding was oftentimes dictated by the level and numbers of attacks that you launched. So the more you launched, the more money you got. Um, and then logistics, and then media operations. And this is, again, what I think is often overlooked was that al-Qaeda in Iraq had a very robust media operation mechanism where they put out videos, flyers, had their own newspapers that essentially put forth the information that they wanted people to see. They, they did their own battle update reports that they would provide to the people that would have casualty counts, you know, number of U.S. forces, coalition forces killed, injured, battles they had won, et cetera. And for the most part, in the early years of the Iraq War, the U.S. was not doing a good job of countering that. Okay, so you had an upswelling of very negative opinion against the United States. Um, and they depended on the local population for their support, which became their downfall, because once AQI gained control of an area, they implemented their own version of Sharia law. And as I said, the Iraqis were not, you know, they're religious, but not so much as perhaps other areas. And so they weren't very happy when that happened. Um, whereas Jay Shalmati, JAM, and AQI stands for Al-Qaeda in Iraq, I apologize. And JAM, Jay Shalmati, which is the Muqtada al sadrs group, I'm sure we've all heard about, um, it was more of a populist movement that, yes, was violent, but he still sought to work within the confines of the government of Iraq, all right? So if he controlled the neighborhood, it didn't mean that he came in with his strict version of, of Sharia law. It meant that he just kind of dictated and more so than anything else provided humanitarian services, which were very needed. All right. And here, and again, a brief summary of here's what worked. The first thing is the surge. Um, I believe at this point, 
There may be some dissenters still out there. Uh, the majority of the credit for the huge turnaround we, see, we have seen in Iraq over the last 18 months belongs to the surge of, of additional U.S. troops that were funneled in to Iraq, okay? Because what that did is that allowed these big bases to then, so these big bases became much smaller and coalition forces established posts in neighborhoods and lived there. And instead of rolling out and doing a snatch and grab and going back in, they would go, in, they would go into a neighborhood and they would knock door to door and they would get to know the people. All right, so they built a relationship of trust, that good old missionary term. They BRT'd, all right? And it worked very well because as the citizens saw that the U.S. troops were coming, clearing an area, and not leaving, they realized, okay, so I'm fed up with the, with the insurgency, with the terrorists. I can turn them in, and these guys will go grab them, but then they're not going to leave. They're staying here, and they're securing my neighborhood, and they're, they're keeping it safe. Um, and what that did is it allowed for a very specific targeting of al-Qaeda in Iraq and Jaysh al-Mahdi leadership. And the, the targeting was so effective, particularly when it came to Muqtada al-Sadr's organization, that Muqtada al-Sadr announced a ceasefire. He said, okay, we're done. And then what the U.S. military very wisely did is they took what he had hinted at, turned it on its head, and said, Sadr has said, he will honor the ceasefire. And as an honorable, upstanding man, because in the Middle East that is still very important, you hold to your word. And they kind of backed him into a corner. And he held to it. He kept his guys off the street, which then allowed the U.S. military to focus on al-Qaeda in Iraq. And within eight months, that organization had essentially been broken. Um, and with that, and though I jumped ahead, these areas were able to be held because there were far more effective and better trained Iraqi security forces who came into the neighborhoods behind U.S. forces. Uh, they had been cleaned out enough to where they weren't corrupt. Okay, so a lot of the corruption had been kicked out. Uh, they were wise in where they placed these individuals. They would put a primarily Shia Iraqi army unit in a primarily Shia neighborhood. Okay, so you, you got rid of a lot of that, what is called ethno-sectarian violence. Um, and for the most part, it's worked, and I think what we see in Iraq today is, is evidence to that fact. There are still a lot of problems. There's still a very long way to go, um, but the elections, for the most part, went off without a, without a hitch, and though we still have these what we call high-profile suicide bombings, for the most part, security has, has gotten a lot better. Okay? So that, that is a very brief snapshot of perhaps one of the most complex foreign policy problems we've dealt with in the last decade. So what I want to do is take this as a framework and move on to Afghanistan, which is perhaps where I spend uh, most of my time, most of my focus, all right, is in Southwest Asia. Um, Afghanistan has a different problem set, okay? There are some similarities, but the primary differences lie in one, in the geographic location and the countries that surround Afghanistan. In Iraq, Iran was involved to a large extent, the Revolutionary Guard, in training Sadr's people. Okay, but once we took Sadr's people off the street via that ceasefire, a lot of the Iranians' effectiveness dropped significantly. What you have in Afghanistan, let's see if I can get this laser pointer to work, is in the east and in the south, okay, this is primarily uh, a Pashtun region, all right? Afghanistan is comprised of several different tribes. You have Hazaris, you have Tajiks, you have Uzbeks, you've got the Pashtun. I mean, you've probably got 20 different ethnicities or tribes. Um, and over here, in this area right here in Pakistan, this is Pakistan right here, you have what are known as the federally administered tribal areas, or FATA. And what that means is Pakistan doesn't do anything here. They have no control. They literally cannot drive a military convoy down a street without the permission of the local tribal leader. Okay? Tribes rule this area, and these tribes, their traditional boundaries cross borders. So they're into Afghanistan. And to be perfectly honest, the Afghanis and Pakistanis that live here do not view this as a border. They cross and go back and forth 
with great ease. There is nobody stops them on either side for the most part. So if you think about that, when we went after bin Laden in early late 01, early 02, where did he go? He came over here into Pakistan, and we are fairly confident that that's where he is today. Um, but again, they cross without any problem. And so when things get too hot for Taliban or Taliban leadership, the al-Qaeda, al-Qaeda leadership, they literally jump ship and come over into Pakistan. Um, the, and what that does is Afghanistan traditionally during the 90s was a, a huge training ground for the terrorists that, we've, that we see today, that we know and deal with today. Those training camps, for the most part, have shifted from here over into here into Pakistan. And I've just provided here just kind of a snapshot. This is from a, a Taliban propaganda video. And what it shows is what you've got here are children. Um, we're not sure if they're Afghani, Pakistani. We don't know their exact origin. But it's a, a, an entire video, a training video, that is dedicated to how to indoctrinate and teach children to become suicide bombers. That is the entire reason that it exists. Um, and so all the training occurs here, and then they come back into Afghanistan and do their, their jihad, as, as, as we know it. Um, the other problem set that we deal with, and I'll jump ahead to the next slide, and again to understand it, is Afghanistan has essentially been at war or stuck in the middle of a war for the last 30 years. Um, you had the Russians that were there for 12 years that successfully destroyed that country. Um, and again, this is an example of different groups in Afghanistan that came together, the Mujahideen of Charlie Wilson's war fame, okay, who banded together and with significant help to the tune of $700 million a year in weapons from the United States, successfully pushed the Russians out. And to an extent, it can be argued that broke the back of the Russian Empire, um, or the USSR. As a result of that, there's non-existent infrastructure in that country. Um, if you want to drive to Kabul, from Kabul to Jalalabad, which is probably 100 kilometers, I have no idea what that would be in miles, 50, 60 miles, it takes two and a half, three hours, okay, because the road, it's half the road is non-existent, it's potholed, it, so the ability to transport and move goods around isn't there. As a result of the war, there are high illiter illiteracy rates, which means there's a lack of education, which means the people that live there are more prone to holding on to the tribal traditions that have been there for thousands of years. And as a result of that, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda know and understand the tribal codes and are able to move fairly efficiently from tribe to tribe. They know what they can and cannot do. The coalition that is there has no clue. You know, we still have not fully cracked that code. And as a result, we make a lot of mistakes and upset a lot of people. Um, I talked about the, the, the uh, northwest Pakistan uh, drug trafficking. Seventy percent of the world's opium comes from Afghanistan. And that's with uh, 60,000 coalition forces in Afghanistan trying to shut that down. Again, we can't do it because to do that, to a large extent, upsets the tribal balance that exists. We'd have even more problems if we completely cut that off. It is a very big focus, but the drug traffickers and the Taliban and al-Qaeda work very closely together, and there are agreements. Taliban provides security along their routes. They get a cut of, of, of the goods, okay? That, in turn, funds their efforts. The Taliban is an extremely well-funded, at this point, insurgency, all right? Um, the terrain, we've all heard the stories of Tora Bora, Operation Anaconda. Uh, it is very difficult to operate in those areas. There are thousands upon thousands of caves upon which these individuals can store weapons themselves. It's difficult to flush these people out. And, as we talked about earlier, it is fractured by tribe and by ethnicity. Okay, there is not enough ire in Afghanistan yet, and we hope it doesn't get to that point where these individuals have banded together and determined to cohesively, you know, unite their efforts and push essentially the United States out and then our other coalition partners. Uh, that hasn't happened yet, but to counter the insurgency, these insurgents, the Taliban, Al Qaeda, operate. They go back and forth between these individuals. All right, with the exception of the Hazari, who will literally. 
uh, drawn, quarter, and Arab on site. Okay? Um, and you think I'm kidding. My wife forbid me from providing some pictures that demonstrate some of the stuff that they're capable of doing. Um, so now what has happened is that our past approaches, when we first went into Afghanistan, our sole focus was to capture bin Laden. That's all anybody cared about. The CIA came in, they hired a whole bunch of independent contractors, ex-Special Forces guys, and they dedicated all their efforts to capturing bin Laden. And it didn't work, obviously. And one of the biggest problems was the fact that they ignored the tribal element. They did not engage what we call key leaders or centers of influence. They went out and there's a saying in Afghanistan that says you don't buy an Afghani, you rent an Afghani. Okay? You rent him until the next person comes along and offers another bribe, and then he'll turn around and sell you out. Okay? And so there was a lot of that back and forth. And to be honest, the intelligence community for the most part and the Department of Defense was very ineffective in their efforts to flush him out. And for the first three or four years in Afghanistan, there was very little engagement, again, with these local communities, these local tribal leaders, which is where these insurgencies germinate, grow, and then move out. Okay? Um, we weren't successful in putting together infrastructure projects. We would build a huge water treatment plant where it wasn't needed. We would put in a road that went literally to nowhere. You have the bridge to nowhere in Alaska. We have got two or three roads in Afghanistan to nowhere. They just kind of go along. There's a nice paved road, and then it stops. And there's no objective as to where it's going. We just thought, oh, it's a great idea. Let's put a paved road in. You know, it looked nice. Infrastructure projects, projects. yay, woohoo. It was worthless. Um, they tried to counter a lot of this with what we call these human terrain teams. How many of you guys have heard of the human terrain teams, human terrain systems? Okay. What it is is they take uh, essentially, they meld together cultural anthropologists, people who have PhDs, you know, in Southwest Asia, or understand the makeup, but typically who are, and this is not a knock against academics, who are academics, and who understand it from a, a book perspective, but don't understand the U.S. military, don't understand the U.S. military decision-making process, and when you put those two elements together, to try to work together, it's like oil and water. They don't mix. They, they don't do well together. Because you're, you're taking a 45 or 50-year-old individual who is a true expert in Afghanistan, and you're sticking him out in a little what we call forward operating base, which has no running water, nothing. And we expect this individual to go out on patrol with, with the battalions, meet with these local leaders, and oftentimes they don't speak the language, and then somehow magically divine all the problems that exist within that community. Okay, they're just supposed to come up, they're just supposed to know. And they're supposed to go to the U.S. military and say, okay, do this, this is how it's supposed to work. It was billed as the magic pill and it hasn't worked. Um, the idea and the principle is sound. Um, the other problem is that you have strategic intelligence gathering efforts. What I mean is, again, on a much higher plane. Okay, but there's no what are called low-level source operations, where you are trying to gather intelligence and put and piece together what the real problems are on a community-by-community -community basis. Because you can't look at Afghanistan as one big hole. Karzai's government controls Kabul. And even in Kabul, Karzai is a prisoner in his own presidential compound. That man cannot leave without a real threat of, a, of an assassination attempt. So Karzai is... is is handicapped entirely by his ability, inability to do anything, okay? Because you get outside of Kabul, and it's the different warlords and tribes that rule those areas, okay? And it's typically the guys with the biggest guns and the most clout with the local population. And where that comes in, then, again, from, from the coalition perspective, is the, uh, there is a lack of coordination and in information campaigns. Uh, the Taliban is extremely effective at producing propaganda. Um, they are, you know, they could give, dis they could give, you know, doctoral level courses on how you do this and how you effectively target a community and manipulate the way they think so they start coming around to the way that you think, okay? Um, and the U.S. and our coalition partners, what is known as ISAF, the International Security Assistance Forces, have been inept at countering this. And there are there are coalition partners, European coalition partners, who are opposed to it. 
who do not think that we should conduct influence operations. They think it's wrong. Okay, uh, I obviously disagree with that opinion. They're okay with going in and kicking down a door and killing 20 people to get one guy, um, which has very negative repercussions, but they're not okay with essentially doing what the media does, which is manipulate a mindset. Um, so, again, looking at the problem set that exists in Afghanistan, uh, there are a few things that I think are very important to the way forward as to how we can actually have success there. Because if you look at the history of Afghanistan, Afghanistan is the country where empires come to die. Okay, uh, Genghis Khan, not successful. Napoleon Bonaparte, that's where he went, that's where he got stuck, that's where he stopped. Okay, The British Empire, all right, again, same thing. They were there for 20 years trying to figure that place out. And their withdrawal from Afghanistan signified kind of the sunset of the British Empire. That was it. Uh, things went sour from there. And you can't tie it all to Afghanistan, but Afghanistan has played a key role in it. The USSR in the 80s as well. They were there for 10 and a half years. And they left, and three years later, the USSR fell apart. And there are a lot of different elements that, came that, that play into it, but Afghanistan has always been very key in the realm of public opinion. Um, because you can't hide a what you might want to call a continual defeat forever, okay? Eventually, domestic public opinion catches up to you, like it did in Iraq, where we were not doing well, and then requires an, either a major change for a course of action, or it requires you to leave. Those are your two options. Um, and Afghanistan still is not to that point here in the United States. For the most part, it is a fairly, it's not an accepted war, okay, but it's not, it's not like Iraq. There are not these vehement feelings of we need to get out. <clears throat> and that's because you can tie most of the terrorists and the 9-11 training camps back to this country. That's where Osama bin Laden is. I mean, so there, so there are some things that, that make it justifiable for us to stay there. Um, and just as a side note, I found this fascinating. I came across this uh, a couple, couple days ago. Um, that, that northwest area of Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, they can trace roughly 90% of either th terrorist cells, as we know them, you know, that these splinter cells that exist throughout the world, they were either trained or are funded by individuals who hail from that region, okay? Um, <clears throat> but, so going back, so what we need to do is first gain an understanding of Afghanistan on a community by community, tribe by tribe basis, okay? Without that, we will fail in Afghanistan. We will not succeed, okay? Um, <clears throat> this is accomplished through something that's called atmospherics, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, the next thing is this troop surge, which Obama has stuck with, these 30,000 extra troops, will allow for this strategy of clear, hold, build, okay? And Afghanistan, in and of itself, is not a place where conventional U.S. forces, so tank battalions and cavalry units, can find success, all right? What, what these will do is they will enable the special forces unit, who are much more adept at operating in terrain and with the types of people that exist within Afghanistan, they will secure the outer rings and allow the special forces units to focus on the more targeted activities that need to happen that are, that are essential to essentially breaking the backs of, of the Taliban and, and al-Qaeda in Iraq. Because the Taliban now probably has control of roughly 60% of the country. And if you remember that map, it's along the east and on the south, all right? They, by control, I don't mean they're, they're not only there, but they have already implemented a shadow government. They're carrying out their own version of Sharia law. So it's, it's kind of a 92, 93 all over again when they came in after the Russians left. <coughs> Um, you need to cut off the drug trafficking because by cutting off the drug trafficking, you cut off a significant force, source of funding. And then this one, which is probably the most impossible one, is you have to secure the border and its passes. Um, when you're in the border area, you, no kidding, half the time, you don't know if you're in Afghanistan, you don't know if you're in Pakistan, okay? You're never sure because it's delineated on a map, but those who are there and who live there and travel back and forth that border is quite literally non-existent, which facilitates that passing
back and forth of, of these insurgent groups. Um, this next point we are doing and we need to continue to do is we need to continue to hit Al Qaeda and the Taliban inside of Pakistan. Okay, we are currently doing this through unmanned predator drones, Hellfire missiles. Uh, I don't know if, granted, I'm a U.S. government nerd. I follow you know the most recent intelligence reports, um, but <clears throat> Al Qaeda has been significantly weakened over the last year because of these these strikes inside of Pakistan. Okay, now we run a huge risk by doing that. We risk upsetting the Pakistanis, the general population, um, but that's a risk that I think is, is worth taking. Um, then this bottom one is to create an understanding of the ISAF, which is the international, which is NATO, and then U.S. forces Afghanistan mission, okay, and counter Taliban and Al Qaeda propaganda through coordinated and targeted information dissemination efforts. And by that I mean we need to become far more active in engaging the Afghani population on a community by community basis, whether it be through radio, through TV, that essentially educates them as to what our mission is and what the objectives of, of the enemy or the insurgents are. Um, <clears throat> what I've got here is just a brief, whoops, I had the wrong. Um, this is from the Intel Center. I don't know if those of you who do research, if you're, this is a great resource. But th these are uh, production facilities and videos that uh, what they term as jihadi, so Taliban or al-Qaeda, produce and disseminate. Uh, and these are videos. You also have radio spots that they run. They purchase ad time on, you know, they own their own radio stations, they own their own TV stations, and they have an agenda. Okay, just like Hezbollah owns and runs its own media outlet as Hamas, you know, there is an, an overarching intent there. Um, and then what, so you have these, these production centers, and again, the south and the east, and then these are the claimed attacks, you know, they, that they claim that they've hit coalition forces. These are their numbers. Um, our numbers differ significantly in claimed attacks and then numbers of casualties. I believe last year they claimed to have killed, and don't quote me on this, I think eight or 9,000 coalition forces when I believe total casualties were probably just over 400 across the board, and that includes actual battle deaths and then accidental, you know, helicopter crashes, et cetera. Um, so these are the types of things that, that they do, okay? They target, they engage, they disperse propaganda. Now, the role of atmospherics, and let me define it real quick. So atmospherics creates an understanding of local communities and their concerns and provides military leaders, so a battalion commander who's in charge of just a single valley, with the necessary situational awareness to make informed decisions. Okay? The classic example that is given is there was a military base that was in a remote valley, and there was a village about two and a half miles away, and they started lobbing rockets at them. And they'd never shot at them before. <clears throat> and the U.S. military commander said, okay, we're just going to go plow through this village and, you know, be done with the problem. And instead what they did is they, they sent out their, their local cultural expert, who's an American citizen. He went into the town, met with the, with the leaders of the city, and they said, you know, he's like, why'd you guys fire rockets? And he said, well, it's just we wanted to get your attention. We want you guys to do a few more patrols through the area because we've got, you know, the Taliban is coming in at night. They're doing different things, and we'd like you to guys be, we'd like you to be here more. So it was a simple solution to what was viewed as a very complex problem, okay? Um, and what, what atmospherics, how it's done, is it's, it's done through what you call low-level persistent polling. So you just engage the local population and you ask very basic, very benign questions. So you don't go to them and say, hey, you talked to the Taliban lately? It's not that. It's what's the cost of food and gas at the market? How available is water and electricity? How potable is your water? Okay. What infrastructure projects would you like to see and why? What's being taught at the local mosque? Just basic questions, okay? And there are probably 40 or 50 data points that are asked on a weekly basis, which allows you to put together this big picture. And what it does is you can measure the temperature of a community. You can decide if a community is hot or cold. How do they feel towards the U.S. military mission in the area? And you can map what's called the human terrain. So who's who in the zoo? Who do you need to engage? Who are the key leaders you need to talk to? And who can you, for, for lack of a better term, because you have limited resources, who can you ignore? Okay? Um, 
And then it allows you to create predictive analysis on events and reactions to events. Um, so what would happen if we went and took out this individual, if we had to bring him in for questioning? What would the repercussions of that be? How would the community feel? Would we feed into the insurgency? Okay, and then create more negative feelings and hence increase the number of attacks. Um, and that is done through what we call micro and macro targeting. So you ask questions sometimes on a block by block basis because sometimes it'll vary. Or how does the entire community feel? So there, there, there are varying things that exist there. Now, in conclusion, because we're almost out of time, this is just one of many different ways that, that the coalition, primarily the US military, is redirecting itself to hopefully create a situation that will allow for Afghanistan to function on its own. That will be very difficult. My guess is we will be there for a dozen more years trying to prop this up. And to be perfectly honest, even though I'm actively engaged in this, uh, there will be some shock and awe on my part if we are successful in creating a country that is able to stand on its own without becoming susceptible to the insurgency, okay, to the Taliban, to groups like Al Qaeda. Um, because Afghanistan, in the mid-90s, you have states that sponsor terrorism, but Afghanistan in the 90s was a state sponsored by terrorism, okay? Al Qaeda bought its way in and then controlled the operations there, um, which is why it's key that we have to hold on to and, and essentially find some modicum of success that allows for stability in Afghanistan. So with that, I'll, I'll close, and we've got a couple minutes for questions if there are any. Um, he wants to know, uh, is the U.S. military capable of, make sure I've got this right, of essentially adopting and, and bringing in the information that a, a cultural anthropologist would provide and effectively utilizing that information to conduct more effective operations, correct? Is that? Um, I think it's a mixed bag. It, the older generation of officers, to some extent, say no, okay, because they they view those who don't carry a gun is weak, okay? So there is a definite mentality within the U.S. military that, that is, there, there's a pushback against it. But the younger generation, these colonels, these young colonels, lieutenant colonels, majors, on down, have seen the value of it because they have been on the streets in Iraq or Afghanistan now for, we're coming up on almost eight years that we've been engaged in this. So they have, the first four or five years, no. But in the last two or three years, there's been a definite shift. But what they want, and it is, it is understandable, is they want someone who understands their culture as well and who can talk to them in their language, use their acronyms, because that is a world of acronyms. That is a, it's a different world, a different mentality. And that has been very difficult to find. And what we have found is it is more effective to bring an individual who is prior military, and it's oftentimes a special forces individual, okay, um, who is not a conventional military thinker, and who is educated, and we embed that individual with, with the military unit. And we embed them with either an Iraqi American or an Afghan American who originates from these communities of interest. And we have found that to be a very effective way in engaging these local communities, okay? Um, because you meld kind of the two together. So, any other questions? Um, no, there's a very delicate balance that exists between the Taliban and these tribes. Um, the Taliban definitely uses methods of intimidation. Uh, just two weeks ago, on the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan, the Taliban captured four individuals who were local leaders and essentially dismembered their bodies um, and then took their dismembered bodies and put them in the, in the town central gathering area with a sign that said, 
this is what happens to you if you mess with the Taliban, okay? And on weaker tribes, that's how they do it. But there are, there are certain tribes that are very strong and beholden to a very strict code of ethics that is somewhat twisted by our terms but makes sense to them. Um, and they, the Taliban is very successful at walking that line. They know who they can push and they know who they can't push because they've pushed the wrong people before and they've been destroyed. I mean, the, the, the tribe itself has turned on them and kicked them out. And that is a big struggle that, that we have, all right, is the U.S. military, is, co is the coalition, is we are now finally beginning to engage these tribal leaders in a way that, that they understand and that works for them that then allows us to essentially counter the Taliban's efforts because essentially it becomes a battle for hearts and minds. It's not so much terrain. Because if you win the heart and mind of someone in Afghanistan, you win that piece of ground they stand on. Okay? It's not a traditional military battle. It is much more a hearts and minds struggle. So. So is it, what, what is being done to counter the indoctrination efforts of the Taliban that targets the younger generation? Okay. Um, <clears throat> it is just starting in Afghanistan, but it is essentially educational systems because the educational system that exists in Afghanistan and Pakistan is the madrasa, which is a traditional Islamic educational system. And so what the more mainstream Afghanis, which is the majority of Afghanis have done to some success now uh, with the assistance of the State Department, U.S. Agency for International Development, is they have created a parallel education system, okay, that targets not only the youth, but also specific age groups, okay. Um, there are training classes that are offered. The university systems have been bolstered significantly. Uh, public education is a huge area of focus, uh, and that has been met with some success. Where we can't touch and what we can't affect is what goes on in Pakistan, and that's where those classes are happening. Those classes happen in Afghanistan, but in Pakistan more so. We can't touch that. I mean, there's, there's nothing we can do there. And so that is, that is why it's such a huge area of concern. I could probably take one more question, and then I've got to go ahead. That is an excellent question. If you answer that, please get back with me. Um, because nobody really knows, because it's never been done before. Um, every country that has entered Afghanistan has left Afghanistan entirely defeated with their tails between their legs. Um, and it is because of the, the makeup, the demographics of that country. Um, I would say that it will happen when we're able to create what will be a very delicate balance, a central government that has agreements with these different tribal areas or warlords that control huge swaths of Afghanistan and everything that happens there. Um, if that can happen and we can create a, a central government that then has decentralized components that is fairly stable and that most Afghanis like or can buy into or, or is tolerable, then we'll probably reach a point that we can do that. <clears throat> but the biggest concern is that we don't want a weak central government that then is overthrown in two years, which then allows for what happened in the mid-90s in the Taliban and Al-Qaeda to happen all over again. It's a cycle we, we don't want to repeat, but unfortunately it's an area that's very susceptible to that. And that's why it's my guess that we'll be there for, for quite some time. So with that, I think we're, we're finished. Thank you.